right, we are here live at Lima Christian School or Crossroads Church, whichever one you want to be. We are actually in a classroom, and uh, good times tonight. I hope you guys are having a good week. Uh, my soccer season is officially over, ended last night, so a little more uh, freedom, but sad that it's over. Um, but anyway, so we are uh, here jumping in Colossians. We are in chapter 2. Next week is prayer, is corporate prayer, so uh, we'll be in the sanctuary praying together. Encourage you, those online that uh, watch this, if you want to come for a prayer time, it's a really good time. We get together and just get before the, the Father, and we pray, and sometimes we do some worship, and it's just a good time. So next week, we'll not be here uh, online. We will not be online just because it's really difficult to um, tape a prayer time. So we're not going to do that, but next week, we are going to be... Uh, doing that, and then we'll follow up. The following week, uh, my brother-in-law, I'll be here, but uh, I've got a lot going on these next couple weeks. Um, next, well, this weekend, we got a funeral uh, for Ralph uh, Thompson, and uh, I'm doing his funeral uh, here, and then we have our fall festival Saturday night for our youth and our young adults, and so that's a busy Saturday. And then the following week, I'm going to be going with the uh, Lima Christian School senior class. They've asked me to go and speak at their retreat. So I'll be speaking three times at that on that weekend. So it's a lot going on. And uh, so Chris is going to cover me uh, for the whatever that Wednesday is. I don't know what that Wednesday is. It's like the whatever. It doesn't matter. It's the Wednesday after next. It's two weeks from today. Huh? The one it, after the retreat? Yes. The November 1st. Yeah, so it's it's November first, but it's the, it's two weeks from today. You guys have calendars; you can figure it out. All right. So, um, but tonight we're jumping in Colossians chapter two. We're going to start two. We finished one, so we got that going for us. There's a lot in the first five verses, so I think that's where we're going to. Well, probably that's all we're going to focus on tonight is those first five verses. But let's go ahead and pray. Um, any other announcements that I'm missing? Oh, if you're interested. Definitely watch, but if you're around, please come um, on Sunday. We're having our Lima Christian School Sunday. Have a lot of great speakers coming. A lot of it's our 50 year anniversary, so we're celebrating uh, Lima Christian School's 50 year birthday, and so that's the start of it. Um, and uh, we will be doing a lot of different uh, testimonies from uh, principals of the past and different people that worked in the past, and it's going to be a really good Sunday. Uh, the the LCS uh, worship team is going to be doing leading worship, and it's going to be a really fun Sunday. So I'd encourage you to invite someone, uh, come. You can watch online, but it is way better in person, in my opinion. So good stuff. I think that is it. Can't think of anything else. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for today. And Lord, as we continue in Colossians, I pray that you would just teach us that you would help us focus on your word and what exactly it's trying to get across to us, Lord. I thank you for Paul. I thank you for the Church of Colossae, Lord, that we can learn from, that we can uh, help understand our own lives through these Christians' lives and how they lived it and how Paul encouraged them to live and how the word of God taught them. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, teach us as we go through this. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm a little, not really dressed up, but I'm a little dressed up today. We uh, had a chance to go to a friend's, uh, uh, Steve Arnold and I uh, went to uh, a trial today um, in um, Monroe County. So we went to the, the county court heart, courthouse and uh, went there and um, got to support Esteban and, and Nicole. And it was a good time. I mean, he wasn't the, the best outcome for him, but it was, it was expected. Um, so we'll be praying for them. And what they're going through but uh yeah it's always good to hang out with brothers and sisters even in the tough times right and even in that so it is interesting to be there i'll tell you one job i would never want is a d uh the assistant district attorney the guy stands in one spot there's a pile of files about yay high and he just sits there and and he has to say his name every time there's a new file they have to say their i guess it's for the system right so that they they have to record it the lawyer who, you know, it's always a different, not always, but most of the lawyers that are the defense, there's a bunch of different ones. And they're all hanging out, you know, and they've got, 
uh, but he's the same one every time. So they say their name and he says his name. He says his name probably, I bet you, 100 times a day. It's like I'd have nightmares of saying my name. Like I'm like, man, what a job. But it was, it's always interesting because the, the time of the trial, when you have a trial in that situation, they'll say you're at 930, but that means that's what time it starts, but it could, you could have 30 people before you. And there's people off the streets for DUIs and for assaults and different things like that. And then there's guys that come from the back that are actually incarcerated. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting thing to go and, and be there and watch that. But so be praying for those guys. And, uh, yeah. And, and you think about, um, what we talked about last week and, and the understanding of the, of the struggle or the, the agony of, of praying for someone. It's agonizing over praying for people. And I think that's a, there's something about this, as you see in Paul's writings in Romans and Colossians, he says it again in a different way. I think what he's trying to get across is we uh, need to pray. <laughs> and, and the prayer is more than just saying some words to God. It is, it's that, it's that relate. It's almost like you're not begging, but you're, you're, want, you're wanting so bad to spend that time with the Father and wanting so bad to stay in the gap for other people that like Paul was saying at one point, he said, I'd rather you take away my salvation so that my brothers can be saved. And he cared that much about the people. And we see that again. So we're going to, I want to start with this story because I think a lot of us Christians, we know we have something like our relationship with God, but I think we really don't always know what we have. And I think this story, actually, I was reading a commentary today and I caught this story and I thought it was really pertinent to the fact that we really don't know what we have when we have Jesus. Okay, so listen to this story. William Rudolph Randolph Hearst invested a fortune in collecting works of art for his fabled home, Hearst, uh, Hearst Castle. The story goes that one day he read about some valuable pieces of art he just had to have. So he sent his art, art agent, agent to Europe to find them. The agent looks high and low. Months go by. Finally, he returns to California and reports to Hearst that the items have at last been found, but that Hearst absolutely cannot purchase them. Hearst is furious. Name the price, he says. I must buy them. I am sorry, sir, the agent answered, but that is impossible. Hearst is confused, and so the agent explains why. They're already stored in his own warehouse. Hearst had purchased them years before. He'd owned them all along, but he was still seeking them because they were hidden away out of sight. And so he wanted them so bad. He's like, no, you'll go find them. How dare you tell me I can't buy them? They're like, no, you can't buy them because you already have them. And, and so many times we have... We have the power of the living God. We have the love of God. We have the forgiveness of God. And yet we're looking for something more. We're looking for something we feel like we don't have, like I'm missing something. And it's because we're not looking at our own warehouse <laughs> of the love of God and the power of God and the, and the trust of God and the understanding that God calls us his friend and his children and he's there for us. And we miss that one fact that God is already there. You know, people say, well, I found God. What, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> God's never lost. <laughs> you know, I found Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. You just opened your eyes to him. He's always been right there. And I think even as Christians, as we walk in Christ for a long time, we sometimes lose it. We, we lose what it is. We lose that, that zeal or that fire or that relationship, more importantly, right? And I think that's what happens in marriages, too. We forget why we got married. We forget what we have in a, in a spouse that God has given us, the gift that we have. And sometimes we, we, we lose what we've, what we've got right there. And, and sometimes in the world, people are looking out. I want something different. I want something more. And God's going, I gave you what you need. Stop looking at these other places. And so just a little bit of a, of a story that I thought was good that we'll kind of really look into as we're going to continue in chapter two. But let's start here in verse uh, 28 of verse one, or chapter one of verse 28. I don't know what I just said. Chapter one, verse 28. We proclaim him 
admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. We talked about that last week, about being complete in Christ. He says something like this similar uh, in, in chapter 2. For this person, purpose, also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Again, he's striving. He's, he's going after it. He wants to be complete. He wants the church of Colossae to be complete in Christ. There's a wisdom, though, that he's talking about. This wisdom... Is not, it's not human wisdom. This is spiritual wisdom. This is wisdom of above. It's God, what God is calling us to. So understanding what he's going for, what he wants, he's wanting them to learn, he's wanting them to know, he's wanting them to strive to understand the love of God. But he's saying the power is already there, which mightily works within me. It, this is the, this is the, um, I don't want to call it a mystery, but it kind of is a mystery because the fact that the Holy Spirit is in us, the third person of the Trinity is in us. We talked about this last week. The power is there, but how do we tap into it? How do we go for it? Well, look at what this next part says. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face. Remember, Paul hasn't been to Colossae. He's, he's writing this and he talks about Laodicea. He also hasn't been there. So he's wanting to encourage them. Even though you don't see me, you know I'm telling you my heart for you. I'm striving for you. I want great things for you. I'm praying for you. You know, you think about family members that don't live near you, you know, and you pray for them on a regular basis. You haven't seen them in years maybe, but yet you know what you, you want for them and you know what you're praying for them and you, you see sometimes... Uh, God working in their lives, even when you're not there. And that's what Paul sees in Colossae. He sees God working in their life. He's excited about it. And he wants them to have even more of the power of God that's in them than what they already have. And so we never can stay. We got to stay complacent, not, but no, content, but not complacent. Content in knowing that, yeah, I have everything I need. I have God, but I'm not complacent because I want to continue to grow. I want to continue to walk in Christ and learn more of him. So then he tells them, verse 2. Well, first of all, that word struggle, it's interesting. That word struggle is to strive, to, to, to go after something to, 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 to continue. And, and it's the same, actually, word in verse 20, 29. It says, uh, ver, or verse 29 of chapter 1 for this person, all, this purpose, also I labor, striving according to his power. So he's striving according to God's power. And then in, in uh, verse 1, he says, I'm struggle, I have on your behalf. So that word is very similar in the Greek. And it's, it's, it's knowing that I'm not, I don't want to just stay here. And I don't want you all. And that's something that I pray for each one of you. I pray for our church. I pray for myself. I pray this for my family, for my son. I want them to strive for the glory of God, strive for that relationship, because I know that's the only thing that's going to transform them, going to transform you, that's going to change your heart and bring out what the power of God wants to do in you. It's through that striving and that relationship. And then he keeps going. I'm, I'll ask you a question here in a second. Verse 2, that their, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. What's he talking about? What do you guys see in these first couple of verses? He's showing the love that he has for these people. He doesn't even know them. Yes. Personally. That's, that's exactly it. He, he, he's never been there. He doesn't know them, but he cares. He, and so much, you know. Have you ever cared about someone a lot? I don't know. Maybe you guys haven't. You know, just kidding. Right? And, and when, they're, when they're around, you, you don't care about them as much. You know? No, you do. Right? I mean, you have children that have gone off to college or have gone different places. Right? And you don't go, oh, well, they're out of my hair. <laughs> don't really care about them anymore. No. You constantly think about them. Constantly pray for them. Always asking, you know, hope they're okay. And I, I love it when... You know, I say it too. Like my, my mom, whenever I leave her, she says, you know, be safe, drive safe. It's like, 
No, I thought I'd just drive about 100 miles an hour down the road and see what happens. Like, but I say the same thing to Zeke when he's leaving. He'll be going on a plane. Be safe. Like, he can do anything about the plane, right? Fly safe. He's not flying. He's just sitting. Like, you know, but what do we do? We care. We strive for them, right? What else? He wants them to grow. Being, helping each other, being knit together in love. Yes. There, there is that. Uh, and he says that in, in another letter, too, in Ephesians, you know, where he wants them to be knit together, um, working together, so that they're growing in love. What, what does it mean to knit together? You, has, does anyone here knit? Okay. What? I used to. <laughs> okay. That's enough. It's more than I have. All right. So when you knit something, what, what do you need? Yarn, right? The needles. the needles. Is that what those things are called? Those. And the knowledge, right? So you need the knowledge. You got to know how to do it. Okay. You need maybe some talent. You took lessons. There you go. So you need you need some instruction, right? You don't just take those needles and take the yarn and just be like, woohoo, let's see what happens, right? No, you have to. <laughs> yeah, you just throw it up like this. Woohoo, let's see what happens. Oh, look, it's a sweater. No, you have to. Know what you're doing. Someone has to teach you or show you. Follow directions. You got to follow directions. This is yes. really good. So yeah. how do I knit together with love? Think. Is it the same thing? Kind of. Go ahead. But you, you have to have the Holy Spirit working in you. Okay. You have to have a willingness to get to want to do it. Can you learn how to love? is a commitment. Love is a commitment. It's a the commitment, emotion, that's for sure. The emotion comes with it, but it's a commitment. It is definitely a commitment, and it's something you actually can learn to do. You can because watch. You choose yes. to love. You choose to love, and what happens is love comes because of effort. <laughs> it actually comes from instruction. It's instruction of his that word. Together, that that's Exactly. It's two people coming together. It's not, I think a lot of times what people think is love is just going to be natural and it should just be wonderful. And it's always going to be wonderful. And it can be that way in the beginning and it can be that way all the time. But what happens is you've got to learn to work, to be instructed, to learn that, oh, I'm not doing this right. Or it's not always the other person's fault. I know you think it is, but it's not. So you've got to learn to, to help each other, to learn from each other, to be instructed by others, too, that have been there. Go ahead. If we aren't knotted up, we have to sort it out. Very good, Jean. <laughs> if the yarn, you're knitting together, and the yarn gets knotted up, you have to take, you got to be patient with that, don't you? Because that's hard, isn't it? It gets knotted up, you got to sort it out, right? That is beautiful. Exactly. And it's interesting that he uses the word knit, and, and if you look up the original, it, it, it is just basically being come together as one. And it, and it is actually, it, it's like sewing or like putting those two things and, and knitting them together as something that can't be almost taken apart. Okay. Right? When a bone is broken and it starts to heal, it's called being knit together. Yep. Yep. So it's, it's coming together in a solid way. And when, that, when a broken bo bone is knit together, it's stronger than it was before. I broke my cop both, I, not at the same time, but I've broken both of my collarbones. And they said the spot where the collarbone is broken is now stronger than any, any other part of that bone. And it would, you, it's all, not impossible. It's almost impossible to break the same spot again. And it's like, you think about that. That's what this knitting is talking about. It is, it's that strong. But here's the thing. Love is a choice. But without the Holy Spirit, without God in us, we don't really understand what true love is. Love a lot of times I think in, in our, our people without God, I think what it is, is it's a very selfish thing with, is what they think, but it isn't. True love is unselfish. True love is unconditional. It's very giving. And that's where this is. Our hearts are in love for each other where we're giving for each other. We're caring about each other. Another word that I wanted to focus on, it says, and attaining to all the wealth. Oh, we want wealth in this country, don't we? We want that money. Show me the money. Well, you want real wealth, 
attaining to all the wealth that comes from what? Full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. Let's look at what does full assurance mean? I'm going to look at a couple of scriptures here, but what do you guys think full assurance means? Without doubt. Okay. What else? Completely sure. Okay, without doubt, completely sure. What are some scriptures? Any scriptures come to mind when you think about full assurance? I got a bunch that I'm going to read, but has anyone got one? Can't be persuaded? Oh, okay. That nothing can separate him from the love of God. Yep. I'm going to look up. We're going to go to Hebrews. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to look up a, a bunch here because I want to focus here. I really want to help people understand that they can know the fullness of God and they can know that they have a relationship with God. So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 6. Let's just start in verse 9. <clears throat> says, but beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation. Through we, though we are speaking in this way, for God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in, in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. So that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So there, that same phrase, full assurance, and this is the hope of until the end. Like my assurance is it's going to continue. It's not, I'm not going to get sluggish in the understanding that I know without a shadow of a doubt that I know that my God loves me and he forgave me and he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for me. That assurance should continue to build on itself, not go the other way. We shouldn't be sluggish on the hope. It should bring more hope, right? Let's go to, uh, uh, let's go to uh, 1 John. This is another one that is, is a, just an awesome verse here. I didn't even write this one down. Oh, yeah, I did. 1 John 5.13. We're going to read a couple of verses, but you'll see the very first verse that we read says it very clearly. These things, again, 513 of 1 John, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. The main thing here is, I write these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. That's full assurance. That's not questioning. That's not wondering if I, am, if I know Christ. That's not, uh, do I? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure. No, it's full assurance. And the thing that's interesting is our world right now, I would say the majority of people are very confused. Would you agree with me? Oh, yes. They're not sure of anything, not even really sure of what they should be or how they should do anything. And I tell you, the amount of young people that I have met, and, and I'm going to say not just young people. I got to be honest with you. I've, I've met people my own age, people older generation that will say, I'm lost. I don't know what's next. What do I do? And of course, I tell them, Christ, the word of God. But people, the, what I also have noticed, in the, and even in the Christian world, people don't really want the responsibility of having to do it on their own. <laughs> Take that choice that mom was saying. It's too easy. It's too easy. Okay, people will say that. Yeah, it's too easy. But, but going into the word, the word is the thing that will always, it's that wisdom. It's that spiritual wisdom he's talking about. It's the only thing that's going to give you that hope. That Holy Spirit teaching you through his word. So, guys, isn't that awesome that we can know? We can know. We can know. Like, really? People ask me, what, how, how, how do you know for sure? Well, because the Bible tells me I can know. 
That's why I know. And, and that's the, the point of this whole thing is I can know. Let's go to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Again, full assurance. Just in case you didn't get it out of Paul, maybe you didn't get it out of John, but how about Peter? Maybe, maybe something will hit you in Peter. Okay? 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 5. And it says this, if I can find it. Let's start in 4. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. And so this one is talking about that assurance is what? In the understanding of the divine nature that I'm escaping my corruption of the world. He talks about moral excellence. And then he talks about knowledge. He talks about self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness. So that assurance, what it does is there's evidence of the assurance of God. There's going to be things that are going to actually show up in my life. And yes, I'm going to learn it by seeking God. But what's so crazy is, Sometimes you are taught these things just by God himself. I mean, Paul, what did Paul say? How did he learn of the gospel? Somebody brought him through it and taught him it. Who was the one that gave him the gospel? Jesus Christ, face to face. Jesus Christ. It was God. God gave it to him. Jesus came to him on the road to Damascus. He learned it. Now, he, after a while, he finally went to Jerusalem to the apostles, and he just kind of shared the, what his heart was, that he was what he was already doing sharing the gospel. And they were like, yep, that is definitely the gospel. I'm putting our stamp of approval, even though he really didn't need it. You know, and I think one of the things that we fail, again, going back to the story of, of Mr. Hurst, is that we have the power in us and we're always looking for something else. Oh, I got to have that Bible study, or I got to have this Bible study, or it's got to be taught this way, or I got to have, right? And those are all great. Listen, do all the Bible studies you want to, please. There's a, Right Now Media is a great resource. It has a ton of videos, a lot of Bible studies. But the best Bible study you will do is what? By is by yourself seeking the word yourself. And then I fervently pray, God, show me. And you know what? People say, well, I do that. Nothing happens. Well, don't stop. Do it again. And then again, and then again, because I'm going to tell you, it's the answer. The, that's what the word teaches us. But what, and here, by the way, let me ask you this question. I know I've said this before, and I want to make sure I make this clear, because I said this to someone the other day, and they were just like, I never thought of that. Did these guys have the Bible? No. Nope. They wrote it. They wrote it. So he's right. He's right in a class. he's encouraging them. Did they have the Bible before he wrote this? They had the Old Testament scrolls. They had not all of them. No, no. And they didn't not. I mean, a regular schmoes didn't have them. Yeah, that's the like they had scrolls of the Old Testament, but like it, they didn't all have them like we have Bibles. No. Yeah. They were they were taught it. Taught it. They yeah. memorized it. But what's interesting is we're talking about. The Old Testament they knew, now he's trying to help them understand the New Testament, which is the New Covenant. They didn't have the New Covenant written down. Yeah. It was told to them. And i got to be honest with you, these guys had way better faith than we did. A lot of them did. Of course, these guys were also being persecuted. <laughs> you know, they were being beaten and some of them killed for their faith. And so what did they have that we have? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. 
Why do you think Paul keeps bringing it up? <laughs> because that's the thing that has the power of God. It's receiving the Holy Spirit. How do I do that, Josh? I surrender to it. I ask God to show me. And then that builds on itself. You know, you go, going back, and I just, I, I wasn't, I was in Second Peter, but going back to that, <laughs> I didn't realize I had that marked. So, um, going back to that, you think about this. I first had to be partaker of the divine nature. That's the first thing in, in chapter one of Second Peter. And that says, having escaped the corruption that is in the world of life. I have to accept Christ as my Lord and Savior, be forgiven of my sin. Then, now for this very reason, also applying all diligence. Now I can be diligent in your faith. Supply moral excellence. I can only do this by a relationship with God. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. Again, can I have real knowledge without God? Uh, the other day, uh, I, w I don't remember who I was talking to, but... They were asking questions about, um, you know, just relationships and stuff like that. And, and, and I said, have you sought Jesus? You're seeking my counsel, which I'll give you a counsel. You're seeking other people's counsel, which it's good. It's fine. But are you seeking Jesus on this? And a lot of times what we want is we'd rather hear from each other than from God. Like, oh, Gene said it must be true, right? Well, Why? Is she bringing you to the word? Which I know, Jean, she probably will be. But the question is, am I actually seeking God or am I seeking what I want to hear so that I can get that little pat on the back and my itching ears get what I want to hear and then I feel good about myself and therefore I can go do what I want to do? No, seek the word. Seek Christ first. And in your knowledge, self-control. Now, that's a good one for relationships, right? They, I know. They go ahead. build on each other. They do. And this is what, this is basically reading the Bible, right? I mean, this is what happens when you read the Bible. You get divine knowledge, you get unbelievable divine nature, you get that knowledge, you get that understanding, the excellence, the moral excellence. Then knowing, I, I start getting self-control and I don't even know how. God does these things. So that perseverance that he's calling us to, we can't do it without God. We will always fail. And then again, godliness and brotherly kindness and all this stuff. Does that bring anything else up to you guys? All right. Let's go back. Well, actually, I got a couple more. Sorry, I got I got to bring these up because a couple of these are really good. This uh, one more. Go to um Oh, oh go ahead. It does. When Peter ends this letter, he says grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and that's what he's promoting here. That's yes. What he's Encouraging yes. Leader. And it never ends, by the way, guys. No. It never ends. The only time it's going to end is when we are there. That's when it ends. Like our, our knowledge and our growth in the knowledge, it's not going to end until we see Jesus face to face. And he does not tell us to stop. <laughs> Once you get to a certain point, you're fine. Just stop. No, I'm growing in it. And, and there's where, tell me that's not what we want for our kids. Right? Well, guess what? That's what God wants for you. It doesn't matter how old we are. It doesn't matter how long I've been in the church. It doesn't matter all this stuff. We should be learning and growing in the knowledge of Christ. All right. Um, I didn't write it down if this was first or second. So we're going to go to Thessalonians and we're going to check it out and have some fun and see if it's uh, chapter uh, one we're going to be in. I got the, the chapter and the verse, but I think it's it says, verse 5, chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, yeah, it's this one, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. 
And I love this because it's that full conviction he's talking about. It's that understanding and, and the imitators. Like these people saw the message and they followed Paul. They listened to Paul. And then they grew in themselves because of what? Did Paul say, you just followed me? No, he says, you followed me, but you also became imitators of us and the Lord having received the word. They received the word, not just Paul's word, but God's word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. There it is again. The power of the Holy Spirit. So then they became examples. And I think this is the other thing. A lot of times in Christianity, what we want to do is follow certain people all the time. Great, praise God. But what are you doing with it? The goal isn't just to become a, a, a John MacArthur or a Vody Bauckham. These are guys I listen to. Or a Joe Foch or a Bill Gallatin disciple. And none of those guys would tell you that's not your goal. <laughs> they would always say, no, your goal is to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And, and that's where I think Bible studies are good. Obviously, we should be in them. But if they're not leading us to be examples ourselves, then guess what? We're missing something. Go back to the old adage of the Dead Sea, right? You got everything coming in. You're learning. All that good nutrition's coming in you. But nothing's going out. And what happens to the Dead Sea? Because it has no, nothing going out. Stagnant. Stagnant and everything in it is dead. And you can actually float on top of it, right? You think about it, it's useless in a way, right? Now it's not completely useless. They say that the mud from there is really good for your skin. I don't know, right? But I do know that that understanding is we are supposed to have outlets of life coming out of us. That's what the word tells us. So again, that full assurance, understanding Christ, knowing that. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 2. And again, he says that full assurance of what? Understanding, resulting in true knowledge. What's the difference between knowledge and true knowledge? Where it's coming from. Where it's coming from. And the word is truth. That's right. Yeah, I can have knowledge of something, but the question, you know, have you ever, you ever had someone try to tell you, well, I mean, come on, man, you know the Bible has so many contradictions. You know, I tell them is where? Well, you know, no, I don't. No, you tell me where. Nine out of 10 people have no idea what they're talking about. They just heard that from somebody else. And when you actually look at the so-called contradictions in the word, they are totally obliterated because they're not contradictions. You got to look at the context of what it's being written and, and where it's being written, who it's being, all those things. And when you look at the context, there is no contradictions. But they'll say that. It's knowledge. They heard that, but it's not true knowledge, right? True knowledge of God's mystery. What's God's mystery? Well, it tells us that is Christ himself. This one is a little bit different. Other mystery parts of the scriptures, especially Paul, he's talking about the mystery of Gentiles being believers to the Jews. This one's a little different. This is understanding that Christ, even though in the Old Testament it makes reference to the Messiah being God, it makes reference to all that but the understanding of what? What does he keep talking about that we need, that we've been talking about over and over again tonight? The Holy Spirit. Under The understanding of the Holy Spirit in us, the understanding of Jesus being actually God and all that stuff. Like, again, the Old Testament teaches that. But now there, it's a new mystery, a new covenant, knowing that the, the Holy Spirit, God, is in us. In fact, John MacArthur, I know I'm always picking on uh, uh, these teachers and not saying we get, but John MacArthur... The way he's taught, he talks about it here, um, he says, um, the mystery Paul refers to here is the Messiah Christ is God incarnate himself. So that, that Jesus is God incarnate. That is, again, Old Testament refers to it, but I think this is a mystery that they didn't grasp. And again, that understanding of the Holy Spirit in us. Does that bring up anything? Does anyone want to add or subtract to that? So again, seeing that, that this, this true knowledge, let's go. I know I just came from Peter, but we're going to go back to Peter. I should have just read this while we were there, but second uh, Peter chapter three. Starting in verse 17. 
You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by error of unprincipled, unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. This is what mom was talking about earlier. But he's saying, be careful. And what I want you to do is grow in this knowledge. I want you to grow in the understanding of it, right? He want The mystery of the gospel, right? He says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. I want to grow in that grace. I don't want to stay where I am. I want to continue. And that's what he's talking about here. That mystery that is in Christ. And whom are, it says, in, uh, go back to Colossians chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 3. It says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of the wisdom and knowledge. Everything you need is hidden in Christ. It's hidden right here in the word of God. Again, going, it's, hit, it's going back to Hearst, right? He wanted that painting so bad. And where is it? It's hidden in his warehouse of paintings. All the knowledge is right here. And, and what's crazy is these guys, let me, let me add, again, I don't think it's wrong to go to seminary. I don't think it's wrong to go to college. I think that's all good. I went to college. I did all those things. But, but what's crazy is these guys did not have the seminary. Now, Paul was a very educated man, but he was not ordained in Christ by man. He had Old Testament, but he was ordained in Christ by Christ. Christ was the one that gave it to him. Now, is education wrong? No, I'm not saying that. But unfortunately, a lot of pastors will actually call seminary cemetery. And they call it that because what happens is when you go, you learn of all these different doctrines and all these different beliefs. Is it wrong to learn those things? No, but what happens is you get so caught up in it you lose the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Side yeah, you're sidetracked and not focused on what needs to be. Doctrines are good, but when I'm so focused on doctrine, what I'm missing is the power of God. He doesn't tell me to go learn all the doctrines. He tells me to learn of Christ, the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you guys, what are some different ways that you have seen or you have learned or you have walked in the knowledge of Christ and in the Holy Spirit? Now, I'm not talking like, if you want to share your gifts to the Holy Spirit, that's fine. But I'm talking about actually being led by the Holy Spirit. Has that happened to you? And, and what are some experiences that you've seen it? Teaching Bible study. Okay. That's just something that the Lord has shown me that that's what he's calling me to. And by teaching it, I have to learn more. Absolutely. Constantly. Have you ever prepared so much for a Bible study and the Lord right in the midst of you're ready and you're ready to go and you're actually teaching the, the, the word that he's telling you and, and all of a sudden he kind of changes track on you right in the middle of it? It's like you don't have to give him everything you learned. That's, that's the foundation that that's, you needed to stand on. And then exactly. And then the Holy Spirit takes it from there. Yeah. And there are so many times I go, Lord, I haven't Yeah. Yeah. And that's where preparation's not bad. I'm not, I think we should prepare. I think the word tells us to study to show ourselves approved. It tells us to, to know, right? But, but we also got to be careful of allowing our knowledge to be the thing that's leading us and not the Holy Spirit and not God's knowledge. That's not, our knowledge is not perfect knowledge. I don't know if you figured that out yet. <laughs> or reading commentaries. Or exactly. Yes. And a lot of times what, what will happen to me as a pastor, because I have to study all the time, I'm studying, you know, for this Bible study, I'll study for, I got to teach tomorrow night at, at young adults. And then sometimes I'll, I'll I'm, because my secretary, who is me, by the way, needs to get fired. Um, <laughs> but sometimes I'll do Wednesday, Thursday and Sunday morning. And it's like, ah, so what I turn to is commentaries immediately instead of allowing the word to teach me what's crazy. The thing that is so cool that I have found out is if I will step back and I will look at the three different places I'm teaching, there'll be three completely different books. And all of a sudden they are what? Knit together. Because it's God's word. 
And if I allow it to speak to me and I allow it to show me what's crazy, you, you probably heard it on Sunday mornings where I'll go, oh, on Wednesday night we were talking about this and on Thursday night we were talking on this. And, God, and then Sunday morning is just like the culmination of all three of them come together because we're in Romans, right? And it's like, yeah, but we were in Mark and we were in Colossians, but now I'm in Romans, but it all came like, bat, and it's right there. That's the Holy Spirit. That's not Josh Sonoga. Because I have no idea how it happened half the time. But I get excited when it does happen. I'm like, thank you, Jesus, right? It's like, he, gets, he gets confirmation. He does. I love that. Com it comes from different directions. Yeah, sometimes it's just from everyday life, right? Like something happens and you're just like, wow, that was cool. All right. God, thanks for showing me that. All right, how about, have you ever, um, it was funny, I was talking to um, uh, our, our, our resource officer and he was saying, uh, I, last week I, I taught at chapel, uh, or LCS chapel, and then I spoke on Sunday and, and all, and all of the message was, a, was really just coming together about surrender to the high school students. And it helped me out on Romans too, but he goes, so I was sitting at chapel. The songs were about surrender because we didn't plan that. The songs were about surrender. The teaching was about surrender. And then on Sunday morning, my pastor taught on surrender. And he just said afterwards, I went, okay, God, I surrender. What do you want? Like, you know, it's like, I'm hearing it. I can't stop hearing it. Like, and he's just like, all right, God, I'm surrendering. You know, <laughs> have you ever had that happen? I, I have that happen a lot. You know, the teachings and everything that happens is just kind of bringing you to that. So this, this in, in verse three of chapter two of Colossians, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This, this treasures of wisdom and knowledge, we're going to go to Romans right now in chapter 11. I want to show you something. <clears throat> Starting in verse, uh, we're going to start in 28. We're going to read through the rest of the chapter. From, from the standpoint of the gospel... They are enemies for your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the Father. For the gifts and the calling of God are, are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. He's talking about Israel and, and Gentiles. So these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all the disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For he, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. The unsearchable, you guys think about this. Both the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Now this, in this chapter of Romans 11, he's talking about the fact that he is, that the Israelites have continued to walk away from God and continue to harden their heart. And he's using the Gentiles to bring a jealousy for, so that they will come back to the Savior. But then he says, like, who would ever thought of that? Like, who could come up with that? And who, who's going to argue? And then he brings up Job, right? He's like, who the, remember when Job complained? He's like, God, what are you doing here? You know, I've done, every, you know, I've, I, I don't know if I've done anything wrong. He goes, who are you? Did you put the stars in the sky? Did, did you, were you at creation? You know, and he's just, and he's kind of, I don't think he's being as sarcastic as I'm being, but, you know, it's like, he's letting Job know, I've got this under control. I have a reason for what I'm doing and for everything I have a purpose. And that's what he's telling us. But because his knowledge is unsearchable, it, you can never end learning about God. Never end. I, I, the best teachers I know that have been doing it for years, not one of them would be like, man, I just don't read the Bible as much as I used to because I just don't need to. Not one of them will say that. In fact, they'll say, I read it more now than I ever have. And you watch, their Bibles are falling apart because they're ripping it apart. They're studying it in such a way. They're still striving. They're not complacent. That's what I desire one day when I'm, you know, 30 years into this, you know, 
I want to be stronger and striving for it more than the first day. And, and I tend to get into those lulls. I tend to, you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, I'm not into it as much. Oh, I'm into it. I'm not into it as much. Oh, I'm into it, you know, because I get caught up in the commentaries. I get caught up in those kind of things rather than spending time alone with Christ. Anybody else? Does that come to anything to your mind? I'm doing a lot of talking tonight. Not that I don't usually, but I am tonight more. I like the word mystery. Because it's a mystery, we're isn't it? In, we're in a different realm, and yet we can talk to God. Yeah. And understand it. Well, and just the mystery of his love for us. Like, that's what he's talking about in Romans, the fact that he loves Israel so much that he will do anything to bring them back. That's how much he loves us. You, know, you think about how each one of us came to him. Each one of us really were revealed of God, and every one of us have a different story, but he sought us so much that he did whatever it took to bring us to him. And that's the amazing part. That mystery of God's love, that mystery that he's there. But yeah, Larry, like we can still have that relationship with him and talk to him. And he listens to us. I wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> you know, like I'd be like, you're an idiot. You know, like he doesn't say that. He says, I love you. I'm listening. Have you ever had one of your kids start talking about something they're really interested in and you're not interested in it at all? Not that you guys have ever done this. And then when they're talking to you, you kind of lose focus. You kind of zone. Uh oh, mom does it. No, no, but it's. <laughs> no, but when they're so excited about something that you know nothing about, and they're like, you know, talking to you, and, and you hear, the difference is God knows exactly what we're talking about. He has everything in our best interest at heart, and He's just excited that we're spending time with Him. It's like, that's crazy to me. I, now, I get excited. Like, my son will talk about video games. I love the fact that He's talking to me. And I love spending time with him, but sometimes it is really hard for me to just keep focusing when he starts going off. Or he starts talking about the intricacies of these this music stuff, and I'm just like, I don't care. I just like that it plays music. Like, you know, but he's like, yeah, but the, oh, he loves, like, telling us the different sizes of TVs and the different 4K and this K and the 1060, whatever. And I'm like, does it play a video? Yeah, but this one's way clearer than this one, like... I don't care. Like, back in our day, right? I mean, gosh, man. I mean, like, TVs have come so far. Remember those the old TVs that, like, you literally would break your back? Or, no, the real old ones that were just the small? I, yeah, I remember those, right? I only saw one of those. But I'm serious. Like, yeah, from that to then, all of a sudden, they're so heavy. We had this one TV. It was, like, 800 pounds, right? Now I can get a 90-inch... I can get a 90-inch TV and just walk away with it. Like, you're, like, like by myself. Like, I need, almost don't need any help. But it's like, now they're so clear. Have you ever watched on a really clear TV and you're like, it's almost too clear? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I can see the hair on their face. Like, it's like, I mean, I'm talking the little hairs, not this hair. I'm talking, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's too clear. I don't like it that clear. You ever? It's transparent. Yeah, it's weird. But it's like, man, he starts talking about that stuff and I'm just like, Phew. I'm like, yeah, I don't get it. That's different. It's a different relationship. God wants that time with us. He wants to hear our hearts. That's the, that's the craziness of it, right? All right. Go back to Colossians chapter 2. We got to get to 5. I said I would. Verse 4, I say this so that no one will delude you with pers uh, persuasive arguments. Now, he's, he's bringing up. Remember when we tar started talking about Colossae and we see that there's a lot of different teachings. You got the Judaizers, which are Jewish people coming in behind Paul, trying to teach them that Jesus is great, but you got to do other things. You got to do these Jewish, you know, rituals. You got to make sure you're doing all these things. And Paul's saying, all you need is Jesus. Stop. Don't let them come in. Well, there's other teachings too, agnostics and that kind of thing in their time. And so he's trying to he's saying, I'm telling you these things so that no one delude you with, with persuasive arguments. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and stability of your faith in Christ. He just wants to see them stable. He doesn't want to see them all over the place. And that's the same thing with us. We need to stay stable on Jesus Christ. 
We can't be wavering. We can't be worried about the world or thinking that there's more. The stability of the, of the message of the gospel, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God, right? Romans says that, right? It's the power of God. And, and we've got to understand that that's the stability we've got to stand on. And if anybody tries to take us from this, anybody tries to even come close to taking us from this, they're trying to delude the truth. They're not going to the true knowledge. It's their knowledge. So be careful with this. Because right now, you can get all the knowledge you want on the internet. It's all over the place, right? Someone's going to tell you that the Bible's true. Then someone's going to tell you it's not true. Then someone's going to say, well, Colossae really wasn't a part of the Bible. And some will say it was a part of the Bible. Or Job wasn't a part of the Bible. They'll say this one. Listen, it's amazing to me that this book has withstood the, time, the test of time. But then there's always this one guy or this one lady who is like, well, I've got a new revelation. <laughs> ah, Run! <laughs> Put the hand up and say, talk to the hand. I'm out of here. I'm not listening to you. Go to the true knowledge. And you know what will happen too is when the Holy Spirit is in you and you are walking in Christ, the God will give you godly discernment. And he'll show you that the false teachers, he'll show you those things. If you stay diligent in his word and you stay in, in the prayer and you're seeking after him and you're striving for the gospel. Um. I remember when I first came to Christ, I may have shared this with you, this story with you guys before, but I didn't have discernment, so I didn't know what was right or wrong. And I remember talking to different people and they were, you know, especially when I, I went to Bible college, you know, I went to Calvary Chapel first and then I left. And when I left, Janine and I moved to Tennessee, right? And so I'm in a whole new culture. And, you know, I just thought they were, I, I didn't know a lot of Christians. So I just thought they were all Christians like we were at Calvary Chapel. And I just went there and all of a sudden I'm finding... And Christians believe in a lot of different stuff, right? And I'm like, whoa, man, I got to make sure I know what I know. And it made me get into the Bible even more. It made me seek even more. And and I just remember how, like, I just got so kind of confused here and there. And people were trying to tell me, no, you, you got you to gotta listen. To, you got to only study the uh, King James Version. And you got to only go to this type of church. And you got to only do. And I'm just like, wait, what about Jesus? I remember these, these two guys came to our door. They knocked on the door. And it was, we were new to the neighborhood, so you have people come and always trying to get you to come to the church. And they were, they were telling me about their church. And they kept telling me about their church. And they're like, you really got to come see our church. It was so something, something, Baptist church, which every church in Tennessee, by the way, is like Baptist something. Independent Baptist, Southern Baptist, American Baptist, this Baptist, that Baptist. And then there's a Catholic church every once in a while. But you're like... Holy Baptist, Batman. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say it. But anyways, um, so they came to the door. Yes, Janine, I said it. All right. They came to the door. They knocked on the door. They were trying to tell me about their church, and they're trying to get me to us to come to their church, and they never said Jesus. They never once, like, told me. And I said to them, I said, are you guys Christians? And they were like, well, yeah, of course we're Christians. I said, well, how come you don't talk about him? And they were like, what are you talking about? That's why we're trying to get you to go to church. I said, yeah, you've been telling me everything about your church, but you haven't told me nothing about your God. And they were like, and I said it on purpose. I was kind of being a little bit of a jerk. But anyways, they were like, wow, oh, brother, you're actually right. And we started talking about Jesus. It was amazing. But it's like, don't try to get me to go to your church. Don't try to get me to believe in your doctrine. Try to help me believe in your God. Because Jesus is what's going to actually change my life. So, that's what he's trying to, he's rejoicing in their spirit. He's rejoicing in their, in their good discipline and their stability of their faith in Christ. May your faith be stable in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. You can see that he keeps saying, be steadfast. Over be steadfast. and over again. Beware, be steadfast. And he brings up the Holy Spirit because that's how you do it. He brings up the word because that's how you do it. Be steadfast. Keep going discipline. And he doesn't tell them, I think you, I'm, I'm so excited because you have 5,000 people in your church. You never once see that in the Bible anywhere. You never once see Paul go, I'm, no, sometimes you'll see numbers, but what I'm saying, you'll never see them go, oh, we are so excited because you have, you've grown three times the size you did last year. That's not what they say. They say, we're so excited because you're steadfast in the gospel. You're disciplined. You're walking in Christ. You're 
being transformed by the Holy Spirit. That's the purpose. But yet today, what we hear about is, wow, you know, people always ask, how's the church going? It's going great. How many people you got? Nothing. Why does that matter? <laughs> and I'll answer them, but because I get caught up in it, but it's like, it really shouldn't matter. You know, as long as you're steadfast in the gospel, that's the point. All right, it's eight o'clock, so we got to pray because that's what we're supposed to do at eight o'clock. So, uh, but thank you guys. We only made it five verses, so Chris will start. Chris, if you're watching, you're starting in verse six, chapter two, verse six next week, or not next week, two weeks, because next week is prayer. So hopefully see you guys in the sanctuary together as we pray as a congregation. Uh, pray for Sunday as we have uh, LCS Sunday, but also pray for our Saturday with our fall um, festival that we're having here for our kids. And uh, I just pray that the rain doesn't actually hit like it's saying it's going to hit because we're going to be stuck inside the whole time. and It's not going to be as fun because we want to do a bonfire and we want to grease up some pumpkins and let them walk with them and see. I know I said if it was outside, we could do it. If it was inside, we can't do that because that will make a mess. So pray for us. And pray for wisdom on what we should do in, in that too, because maybe we just do it all inside and we can't do certain things. Yes, Jean? I have some information for prayer. Uh, probably a lot of you don't listen to international news, but Russia is making advances into West Africa. Mali, yes. Niger. My son and wife are in Benin, which is right next to Niger and Niger Coast. So I'm not sure how far they are and what they're going to be be doing i think they're looking well they know that in mali there is gold there's silver yeah, yeah they want they want all the natural yeah. resources of africa has everything resources and um and, and the africans don't have the resources to develop that right stuff you know so Russia's coming by to be their buddy, Gene. They're just there to help Africa. That's all they're there for. I'm being sarcastic if you haven't figured that out. So yeah. just pray for the, the missions Absolutely. and missionaries. And Definitely. They really work there. Thank you for bringing that up. Did you have something? Yes. Um, my niece um, texted me tonight, um, my brother Hugh's daughter, and asked for prayers for her uncle who had uh, a brain bleed a year ago. And uh, his recovery is not going very well, and he's uh, having a major problem with balance, and he's beginning to give up. Okay, what's his name? John. John, okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time, and Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, we can actually be an example to one another of our faith, Lord, of our stability in you, and we can only do it through you, Lord Jesus. I, f I pray you fill us with your true knowledge, with your wisdom through the Holy Spirit, that you would guide us in how to walk in this crazy world. Lord, we pray for the people of Africa and, and the whole situation, Lord, especially the missionaries and, and the believers, the brothers in Christ that are there, as Russia is, is, is just going and trying to take over, Lord, for the resources there, not for the betterment of the people. But Lord, I pray the gospel will continue to, to spread and You'd protect the people that need to be protected, Lord, and just do a great work in the midst. Even bring uh, Russians that are there, the soldiers, whatever they are, Lord, that they would come to the gospel as well and be transformed. We also pray for Israel, and Lord, the, uh, and we just pray for great peace in that in that place, Lord, and we pray for a great work, Lord. I know uh, uh, Hamas needs to be uh, wiped off, Lord, the planet. That's my, that's my heart. But I pray that they would come to Christ first, Lord. I pray that they would be transformed somehow. The evil, Lord, that is in them is pretty crazy. I do pray for the people of Palestine too, the innocent people, Lord, that are putting through this, Lord, not on their own, um, not on their own choice, Lord. I just pray you'd be with them and protect them as well, Lord. And I pray that Hezbollah would just keep to themselves, Lord, and not come down from the north. But Lord, whatever needs to happen for you to show your glory, we pray your glory would be seen, Lord, and that Israel would stand strong. Lord, we just thank you so much for our brothers and sisters there. Lord, we pray for John. We pray for his health, Lord, as uh, he's struggling, Lord, with different things. And I just pray that you would heal his body and, Lord, uh, just be with him, uh, Lord, through this time. We thank you so much for this night, and we pray that you would get us home safe and glorify yourself in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.